Hey guys, welcome back. So millions of people have been jailbreaking their iOS devices for the past eight or nine years and jailbreaking itself has actually been around since the original iPhone, but uh, not a lot of people actually understand what goes into a jailbreak and what actually happens behind the scenes. So in this video, I'm basically going to explain using a very old exploit as an example, uh, what goes into the development of a jailbreak and how it really all works. To keep this video as short as possible and as easy to explain as possible, I'll be using a very old jailbreak uh, as an example, uh, one that was used to jailbreak the original iPhone and the iPhone 3G, uh, but just keep in mind that the method used to jailbreak these devices is very different to methods used to jailbreak modern iOS versions such as iOS 10, because in the nine years that iOS has been about, Apple has invested millions of dollars into the security of these devices, so there are so many different complications that you'd have to take into account when talking about the jailbreak development for iOS 10 or later. So although the jailbreak I'll be talking about in this video is very outdated, this video should still help you understand how jailbreaking works in general and what really goes on behind the scenes of a jailbreaking program such as Pangu, Taiji, Yalu, any of the jailbreaking programs that have been released to the public. So the jailbreak I'll be talking about in this video is the 24k pwn boot rom exploit. There's a post on the iPhone wiki about this so I'll leave a link in the description if you want to get a more detailed explanation on it. Uh, this exploit was a boot rom exploit used to jailbreak the original iPhone, the iPhone 3G and the, uh, the old boot rom version of the iPhone 3GS um, as well as some older iPod touches. Uh, so this exploit is a very powerful boot rom exploit as it allows untethered jailbreak to be created without the aid of any additional exploits. Um, also, as it's a boot room exploit, it cannot be patched as uh, the boot room is part of the hardware, so it cannot be updated or modified by Apple. So this vulnerability still exists in these devices today. So the reason I'm using this exploit uh, as an example to explain how jailbreaking works is because this is probably the simplest form of an exploit that iOS has ever had, and that's because it's simply just a classic stack buffer overflow. So nothing like this has ever been found since because the, uh, the security has increased so much and people are not stupid enough to just let these vulnerabilities happen anymore but this was in the original uh, device, the original iPhone's boot ROM and uh, it allowed you to jailbreak untethered. So for those of you who don't know what a buffer overflow exploit is I highly recommend you go and watch my tutorial on my second channel this basically teaches you how to write a very simple exploit for a very simple uh, classic stack buffer overflow just like the one used in this exploit here so um, if you watch this video it basically explains the main concepts behind it and how it all works. So a buffer overflow vulnerability is basically when a program or app attempts to store more data than it can actually hold and so it starts overwriting other data that's already been stored by the program and uh, therefore allows you to make changes to the program's memory. So the way this is exploitable and the way it becomes useful in jailbreak in the original iPhone is that if you overwrite something important enough you can actually take control of the whole program and make it do something completely different. So in, in the jailbreaking case giving you read and write access to the root file system, bypassing the code signature check so that you can launch any kind of app whether it's signed or not and uh, basically do anything you want to the system. So the way this vulnerability worked on the original iPhone was actually during the iTunes restore process so most of you will know that uh, iOS firmware files come in the form of an IPSW which is basically just a compressed folder full of all the firmware components. You have the DMGs containing the root file system and then you have the RAM disks and then you have inside of here all flash you will have these files which get sent to the device during the restore now some of them are not really needed such as the Apple logos or any other graphics but you can see this file here LLB and iBoot these are the bootloaders now LLB is the second piece of code that runs on the device so after the boot room is loaded what it should normally do is verify the signature of this to make sure it's not been modified in any way and then load this which will then continue to load iBoot and then boot the device up so the exploit was basically that you could modify this LLB and the device would try to write into memory before it verifies it so what people would actually do is they would make this a over, overly large uh, LLB file too large for the device to actually store and therefore when it gets written into memory it doesn't matter that it doesn't have a verified signature because it does the verification after so when it's too late. So basically anything you put on the end of this file that is too big for the device to write into memory it will start overwriting things in the boot ROM's memory and allow you to basically take control of the boot ROM. So hopefully that makes sense. If it doesn't then you can think of it like this. Let's say that the program memory has 
10 slots or 10 boxes, just think of them as 10 boxes. Let's say the last three boxes contain important information that's used by the program. The first seven boxes are what is allowed to store the LLB file, which can be sent to the device through iTunes Restores. Now, if this file was created any bigger than seven boxes, it's going to overwrite some of the last three boxes. So if you create it uh, 10 boxes long, it's going to overwrite everything that's already been stored and therefore basically give you control of the program memory, which could allow you to take full control of the program and get arbitrary code execution. So once the hackers behind this exploit had uh, gained control of the program, they could basically make the program just jump to anywhere and continue executing. So they basically wrote a payload that was designed to uh, modify a root file system to give you read and write access and patch out all the signature verification checks. And uh, basically that's all in the payload. So once they've got full control of the program execution, they just tell it to run this payload and then there we go, you're jailbroken. That's basically how this exploit works. So I'll, as I said, I'll leave a link to this in the description if you want to read the full technical details of it, um, exactly how it works. You can see all of this and about how the payload works and all that. But um, that's basically how this jailbreak works. So it's just one exploit in the boot ROM and I should have a full untethered jailbreak uh, on the device. So of course, having this vulnerability just sitting in the boot ROM of these devices was a huge mistake on Apple's part. And since then, there's never been an exploit quite as simple as this one. Apple quickly patched this exploit with the updated versions of the iPhone 3GS and the iPod 2G. These basically were to the same device, but they had a new boot ROM, which did not have this vulnerability, so you could not use this to achieve an untethered jailbreak. Um, modern day jailbreaks target mostly user land and kernel land, and are rarely ever based in the boot ROM anymore, or any other low level components such as iBoot or the LLB. Um, modern day jailbreaks also are a lot more advanced than the one covered in this tutorial because, or this uh, this explanation, because they have to take into account the bypassing of ASLR, stack canaries, and a load of other more advanced security mitigations that Apple has put in in a in attempt to prevent attackers from taking full control over the device. So since iOS 9, something known as kernel patch protection was added. Uh, this is basically a kernel level security feature designed to prevent you from being able to patch the kernel in any way. Um, this obviously was bypassed by people such as the Pangu team or Luca Tedesco, but there are a lot more advanced things that you need to take into account when developing a jailbreak for a more recent version of iOS. Also, most recent iOS version or iOS jailbreaks are written using ROP or return oriented programming. This is another exploitation technique that's covered in this video, so if you're interested in this, then go ahead and subscribe to the second channel. I'll leave a link in the description. Um, this basically will explain how ROP works, fundamentals of it, and why it is used. It's very unlikely that the public will ever see another exploit as powerful as this one, uh, simply because they are very, very hard to find in the low level components of iOS. And if people do find them, they're much better off selling them to people who want to purchase zero days or to Apple themselves because people pay out uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars for exploits as powerful as this. So there's much, there's much more um, gain from it, from setting them on rather than just releasing them to the public in return for nothing. So that's pretty much it for this video. If you want more videos like this in the future, explaining more technical things or more advanced things to do with iOS or even maybe tutorials on writing some basic exploits, then leave a comment or let me know on Twitter and I will consider making some more. So yeah, hope you guys enjoyed this video. Don't forget to subscribe for more and I will see you next time.